medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram Talk. Almost a million people every year in the United States come down with a diagnosis of a blood clot, and almost all of them get put on some sort of anticoagulation. So the question is, is how long do they need to be on that anticoagulation? Well, we're going to discuss that today. Here you can see in this picture a vein and a blood clot that is filling it. And that's the issue that we've got with blood clots, is that they block the transportation of blood. And as a result of that, there is tissue downstream which is not getting enough blood, and there's tissue upstream which is engorged with the lack of flow of blood. Here's another picture of it, looking at it under a microscope. You can see here an embolism where it was broken off, and this area right here is in a place where it shouldn't be. This is what it looks like when you're looking at it radiographically under ultrasound. You can see here that there is a blockage in the vein. And this happens as a result of either the blood becoming too thick or some problem with the clotting cascade. Now, this is a very simplified version of the blood clotting cascade. As you can see, even in the simplified version of it, it's very complicated. So there's a number of things that can go wrong. And if they do, you either can't clot, as you might have in diseases like hemophilia or other diseases that are similar, or you have too much clotting. And scientists over the years have put together some risk factors. That'll become important as we talk about what to do when somebody does get a blood clot and how long should they be on anticoagulation. So we know that obesity can increase the risk of blood clots. Pregnancy can do that. There is high amounts of estrogen, and we know that estrogen is a hormone that has the tendency of causing blood clots. This actually seems like a reasonable thing to have happen because at the end of pregnancy, there's going to be a delivery, there is lots of bleeding, and you're going to want to make sure that the blood can coagulate. That's going to be important. Oral contraceptives that contain estrogen specifically are the ones that are most egregious in terms of causing clots. Sitting for an extended period of time, we often see this in economy class syndrome. This is a syndrome where people who sit in economy class on planes that are flying for more than four or five hours are at increased risk for getting blood clots. Smoking can increase the risk of blood clots. There's a very strong connection for people, specifically women over the age of 35, who take oral contraceptive medications and who smoke are at high risk for blood clots. So it's important to understand that if you're a woman who's over the age of 35, take oral contraceptive medications, that smoking is going to dramatically increase your risk of clots. When I was on my residency rotation in the intensive care unit, we actually had two women in a single month be admitted to the ICU with very large clots that were life-threatening and had to be intubated as a result of that. Injury or surgery certainly can increase the risk of blood clots, and that's something that is going to be a provoking factor. As you get older, especially over the age of 60, that tends to increase your risk of blood clots. A family history of blood clots is going to portend that there is some sort of issue genetically with the clotting cascade, and that would sort of dovetail into hematological disorders. So there's a number of hematological disorders that can increase the risk of clotting. Think of things, for instance, like protein C or S deficiency. Somebody with a factor V Leiden type of mutation. These are things that are very detail-oriented that we don't need to get into, but very specific mutations that we can find. For instance, the prothrombin G mutation, 20210 specifically, is a mutation that can increase the risk of blood clots. Chronic inflammatory diseases can also increase the risk of blood clots. Cancer, the one that is most responsible for causing clots would be pancreatic cancer. And then atrial fibrillation, which is a situation where the top parts of the heart are not pumping very well. They're not contracting. And as a result of that, blood stagnates here and clots can actually form in that area. Now, depending on if it is on the right side or the left side, if it's on the left side that forms because the left side goes to the body, you can actually get blood clots up inside the brain. And if there are clots that form on the right side, these actually go out to the lungs, and you can get what we call a pulmonary embolism, which is a specific type of blood clot. 
What about medications? Clotting factors, you can actually give patients clotting factors. If you give too much of it, that can cause clotting. Cortisone and ACTH, gonadotropins that they typically give to assist in getting pregnant, chemotherapeutic drugs, valproic acid, furosemide, which is Lasix, that is a diuretic, even gold, which is actually used to treat arthritis, can cause blood clots, and heparin, which is actually a blood thinner in certain people that have a antibody response to the medication can cause clots in some people. So there's actually antibodies that are made against platelets, and that can cause an issue with clotting. A few years ago, there were a very small amount of people at the beginning of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine campaign that came down with blood clots in their brains, and this caused a pause in the vaccine rollout. And it's one of the reasons why at the conclusion of the emergency use authorization for this drug that it was actually pulled off the market because of its unacceptably high risk, although it was altogether low, it was higher than the other options that were out there. So why do I bring that up? Because if we look at some of these, and let me just clear the ink from this page, you'll notice that there are two different types of things that can precipitate a blood clot. There are two different types of blood clots. There are ones that are provoked and those that are unprovoked. And to understand how long somebody would need to be on anticoagulation, which by the way is given to prevent further clots from forming, and it allows the body to reabsorb those clots, but it doesn't take away the thing that caused the clot. And that's the important thing to understand. When that anticoagulation can stop really has to do with whether or not the clot was provoked or unprovoked and more specifically as to whether or not that risk factor can be removed. If there is something that has provoked a blood clot and can be removed, we would put it under the provoked category. Let's look at some examples of that. Pregnancy uh, certainly is something that could go away. Obviously, after about nine months, it does generally. And so pregnancy could be a provoked type of VTE or venous thromboembolism or blood clot. Oral contraceptives certainly could be ended, and so they would also fit under provoked. Sitting for an extended period of time is something that you can choose not to do. Smoking certainly is something that you could choose not to do. An injury or surgery would be considered a provoking factor in a blood clot. However, age, as you get older, is not something that can be changed or taken away. Neither a family history of blood clots. There are certain types of hematological disorders that can come and go, but for the most part, if you have a hematological disorder that is genetic, that is also going to stick around. Chronic inflammatory diseases is something that could come or go depending on the nature of that disease. Cancer is tricky. If somebody has cancer and it's incurable, then this is the type of thing that is not really going to go away. If, on the other hand, the cancer is dealt with and taken care of and the patient is cured from cancer, then it may be something that could be a provoking factor and it would be taken away. Therefore, it would not add to a factor in the future. Atrial fibrillation is the same way. If it's there and it hasn't gone away, it's a provoking factor, but not one that could be actually taken care of and go away. If you have something that cannot be taken care of or it's not going to be going away, then we would call that unprovoked. So let's just say somebody came in and they had a blood clot and I were to ask them, were you pregnant? No. Were you on oral contraceptive medications or other medications that could cause this? No. Were you on a car trip? Were you on a plane before this happened? No. Do you smoke? No. Did you have a recent injury or surgery? No. And you could see that this interview would go on and on, going through all of these factors. If at the end of that interview, I could not find anything that would have predisposed that patient to getting a blood clot, I would write in the chart that this was a blood clot or a VTE and that it was unprovoked. That is going to determine how long somebody has to stay on anticoagulation. If I could find something, then I would put provoked VTE, and that would lead to a completely different conclusion in terms of the length of time somebody would be on anticoagulation, and I'll explain why that is. This is a paper that was published back in 2018 that I had the privilege of actually contributing on. 
I was asked to consult and contribute academically to the design and to the publication of the data that came from this study. This study was tasked to answer the very question that we set out to ask, which is, how long should someone be on anticoagulation? And the title of this publication is Clinical Outcomes of Prolonged Anticoagulation with Rivaroxaban, which is an anticoagulant, after unprovoked venous thromboembolism. And so you already know there what the term unprovoked is referring to. And in terms of full disclosure, I was not employed in any way, shape, or form by the company that makes Rivaroxaban medication nor was in the research group. However, I was paid for the time that I spent reviewing the article and also the publication and the data. The full study will be linked in the description below. So what do we do? We actually looked at claims data. When somebody in the United States gets a prescription, somebody needs to pay for that. Either the patient pays for it or the insurance pays for it. And so this was a nice way of looking at all of those people that had purchased Rivaroxaban, and then we were able to go back and see in the charts exactly what the diagnosis was and when they started the medication and when they stopped the medication. Generally speaking, the treatment for a provoked, so not an unprovoked, a provoked VTE or blood clot is three months and then stopping. And so what they were going to look for is to see what happened to bleeding rates and VTE recurrence rates in those that continued taking the anticoagulation for longer than three months. They say here that the study population included adult patients initiated on rivaroxaban within seven days after a first unprovoked VTE, and they received more than three months of continuous rivaroxaban treatment. Patients who were treated beyond three months, which is the standard for provoked, formed the continued cohort, and the remainder formed the discontinued cohort. So there was those that stopped taking anticoagulation after three months, like the provoked people would do, but these were unprovoked. And there are those that continued on after three months. In other words, we're looking to see what's the difference between these two groups. This is real-world data. This was not randomized. They were not part of a trial. We're actually doing a retrospective review here to see what the differences are. The major outcomes here were recurrent VTE, which would be the benefit of keeping somebody on anticoagulation because you're going to prevent another blood clot from happening. And of course, what's the major downside in keeping somebody on a anticoagulant but major bleeding events? Let's take a look and see what happened. The results were they were able to identify almost 4,000 people who were on rivaroxaban in this case. And what they found was the following. Let me show you the graphs. The first thing that we're looking at here is the benefits of continuing anticoagulation. So the benefits would be making sure that you did not have a recurrent VTE. That's another blood clot after your first one. And so we want to be as close to zero as possible. And notice here that the top is 8%. So it's generally rare, but we're looking to see what is the incidence. And so those in red are the ones that discontinued the anticoagulation right after a three-month period of rivaroxaban treatment. Everybody in this group got three months of anticoagulation, and then when three months hits right here, there is a divergence. There are those that continue with rivaroxaban. Those are the ones in blue. And there are those that discontinued the rivaroxaban. Those are the ones in red. In the first 90 days, there's already a statistically significant difference between those that continued and those that discontinued, which shows that those that discontinued had a higher recurrence rate of VTE. And you can see the difference there is 1.19% versus 0.57%. That's a small absolute risk reduction, but a fairly large relative risk reduction. But as you can see here, as we go on to 180 days, 270 days, and finally 360 days, that immediate difference that we saw in the first 90 days holds true for the rest of the year. And so what this implies is that for those that have unprovoked venous thromboembolism or blood clots, in other words, there's a risk factor that we don't know about, that we can't find, that means we can't get rid of, 
And so it seems as though keeping people on rivaroxaban or anticoagulation is a way of mitigating that risk factor that we cannot identify. If it was surgery or if it was flying on a plane, these are things that we know can cause blood clots and we can modify our behavior. But if it's unprovoked, if we can't find that risk factor that we don't know yet that's causing these clots, then continuing the patient on the anticoagulation seems to keep it at bay. And as soon as it is stopped or discontinued, there seems to be a difference between these two groups. So it seems as though continuing patients even beyond three months of anticoagulation for unprovoked VTEs, at least from a beneficial standpoint. The big question, though, is, is does it also increase the risk of bleeding by keeping them on? And for that, let's look at the next graph. Here's our graph. Once again, we have the initial three-month period of time, and then we start the clock at time zero. Those that discontinued are in red. Those that continued are in blue. We can see them here. We notice that there is no statistical significant difference, even as we go out to 360 days, when it comes to the risks of continuing anticoagulation. And of course, here we're looking at patients with major bleeding episodes. Notice that there's no real difference between these two groups in terms of major bleeding. What does that mean? That means for unprovoked blood clots, the benefits are realized keeping the patient on anticoagulation for longer than three months, but the risk of major bleeding is not happening. It's benefit without a lot of risk. They said that the patients in the continued cohort, 3,763, had significantly lower rates of recurrent VTE than those who discontinued, and we had about 1,051 in that group. And the difference was statistically significant, and you can see the risks there. The relative risk reduction is a 52% reduction in recurrent VTE, and the absolute risk reduction is 0.62%. Which means that the number needed to treat is 162. The number needed to treat is simply 1 divided by the absolute risk reduction. Which means that you would have to treat 162 people with non provoked VTE with anticoagulation to prevent one recurrent VTE, which of course could be fatal. So the conclusion of the study was continued rivaroxaban treatment beyond an initial three or six month treatment period significantly lowered the risk of recurrent VTE without a significant increase of major bleeding compared to treatment discontinued at three or six months. That number needed to treat may sound high, but again, if you're having an issue where there's no major bleeding occurring on this medication, you can see why, even though the benefit may be small, the risk is even smaller. So you might ask, well, do you take this indefinitely? And there's actually some experts that have come out to actually say that you should be on it indefinitely. That's not agreed upon universally. But remember that as somebody gets older, the risks of them having a major bleeding event does go up. They become less steady. They could fall. They could hit their head. And so these are all things that need to be taken into consideration. Certainly, if somebody were to get a disease where they might bleed easily, for instance, an ulcer in the stomach, or actually have an episode of bleeding, then this type of calculus needs to be revisited. And it may be deemed that, in fact, the risks outweigh the benefits of anticoagulation. As always, this type of discussion really needs to be entertained in the presence of your treating physician who knows all the risks and benefits specifically for the individual. However, if this topic interests you, I'd like you to know about our website, medcram.com, which has continuing medical education courses, not just for physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, respiratory therapists, EMTs, etc., but also for the lay public who are interested in this topic for their health. We actually have a course that has CME activity. You can see here that it's a very highly rated course of 4.9 stars out of five with over 200 reviews. If you like this video, please go ahead and subscribe, turn on notifications, leave us a comment, and thanks for joining us.